Well, good morning. Wow, I'm glad you're here. My name is Michael. I am one of the pastors here at Cedarbrook, and uh, I have a secret. Who's good at keeping secrets? Anyone? Good. Interesting you raised your hand. Why would you raise your hand if you're good at keeping secrets? You want to keep that secret, right? Uh, right, right. All right, I joke. I joke. But uh, I've got a secret. Would you like to know the secret? You're not even concerned if it's about you. I mean, we're here in a public place. I'm going to tell you a secret, and you're not worried that it might be about you. Well, it is. It is about you. It is about me. It's about all of us. It's, it's a secret of why we keep secrets. The reason that we keep secrets. And it's really not even a secret. It's just one of those things that nobody talks about. We keep secrets, but we don't talk about why we're keeping the secret, right? We keep secrets because we think by keeping them secret, they'll protect us, right? We're protected by keeping our secrets secret. If you're at work and you've done something wrong, you're going to keep that a secret because it'll protect you from discipline, maybe being fired, right? You can keep that a secret. Maybe you've said something unkind to about one of your friends, kind of behind their back, and you keep that secret because you want to protect that relationship, right? It's some way that it's going to protect you. Or, or maybe you just keep secrets because you're afraid of what has been done to you will get out, and then there's shame that you experience or maybe your family or others might experience. So you, you keep these things secret because they're going to protect you. So today's sermon, we're going to share all of our secrets. No, we're not going to do that. It's actually not anything to do with that. It's, a, it's all about the one thing that we keep secret. It was never intended for us to keep secret. Something in our life that we, we keep secret because we think it will protect us from something. For those of you that are followers of Jesus, that you proclaim that Jesus is your Lord, your Savior, right? The one that you follow, you're going to follow the teachings of Jesus. We oftentimes keep that secret from everyone else. But it was never intended to be kept secret. In fact, it's quite the opposite. We're to tell people and show people because it does something. And that's actually the connecting piece for us in our character for today, as we've been going through these character series where we've been taking a look at uh, different people in the Bible, and we've been looking at three questions, right? Who are they? How do they connect with Jesus? And what do they have to do with you and me today? And our character today is keeping a secret. In fact, he's keeping it so secret, even as you read his whole story, you're still like, I don't know. Like, it's so secret. And our character today is Nicodemus. You ever heard of Nicodemus? It's kind of a funny name, isn't it? Nicodemus. And he's found in the, the New Testament in the Gospel of John. We'll be looking at his story there. So uh, if you want to turn to John chapter 3, go ahead and do that. Um, if you do not have a Bible, you'd like to have a Bible, raise your hand nice and high, and we'll get you a Bible that you can use, you can have here, you can uh, take it with you if you don't have a Bible at home. We'd love for people to engage with the Bible. It's one of my favorite things to do is to nerd out in the Bible. And then I usually end up sharing my nerdy things that I discover with my family. It annoys them, but that's part of my joy. Um, so John, in John chapter 3, we start learning about Nicodemus. Nicodemus has a secret, and he feels he needs to keep this secret because he's got a lot to lose. If this secret gets out, uh, it could cause problems for him because he's uh, part of the Jew Jewish ruling council, right? The people that make decisions and give direction to the Jewish people in their life of faith. He's part of that group of people. And um, he, he's also a person that is wealthy, and so he's got um, some wealth behind him as well as to how this could affect his family because um, their faith and their community life and their family life, they're all intertwined. They're not like separated. They're all together. Um, sometimes we have like a, 
a day of a week where we come and we learn or we explore some things about who Jesus is. And then it's like there's a disconnect when we leave here. Like we go back into our normal life. Like this isn't normal for some reason, right? So their, their life would all be together. Um, and so there's a lot to lose here. Um, because every time Nicodemus shows up in this storyline, it's right after a time uh, where Jesus has done something and it's caused division about what people think about who Jesus is. Could he be the Messiah we're waiting for? Some people are like, yeah, he is. And other people are like, I don't know. Maybe he's one of those false ones. And there's a split between them. Uh, so in chapter 2, right before what we're looking at, uh, Jesus goes and clears the temple. He does this prophetic act of clearing out the temple, right? Turning over tables and all of that stuff. And uh, some of the Jewish leaders are like, where do you get the authority to do this? And others are like, oh, well, of course he has authority to do this. He's the Messiah. He's the prophet we've been waiting for. Um, in chapter 7, he's teaching in the temple, and he teaches some things that's just just dividing people like they're not sure what to do about it and Nicodemus shows up into that that uh, time as well right in there as the Jewish council gets together and they start talking about what are we going to do about this Jesus guy and and uh, Nicodemus has one line one thing he says in that line so a long conversation here one line later, and then the last time that G uh, Nicodemus shows up in Jesus' life is after Jesus has been crucified, and then he is being buried, and Nicodemus is there with Joseph of Arimathea to bury him, and Nicodemus doesn't say anything at all. Not one single word as you go in the storyline. But now he's out in the open, right? He's not coming to Jesus' secret. He's out in the open, so does he believe in Jesus or not? We can't tell. He stops talking about Jesus, but yet he's showing up more where Jesus is. Don't know if he believes, right? And that's exactly the point of this interaction that he has with Jesus. Jesus is going to invite him into making that belief more visible. So John chapter 3, uh, starting in verse 1, I'm just going to tell you right now, there's some weird stuff being talked about, okay? It's a little bit confusing, a little bit hard, and we'll, I'll do my best to navigate through this as I've been doing my best to navigate through it myself. So John chapter 3, sorry, in verse 1. Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night in the cover of darkness. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with them. What does he know about Jesus? That he's a good teacher that has been sent by God. He knows this. How is he showing it? He's going to Jesus at night. Well, what's the big secret? Like, if you know this, why are you keeping it so secret? And also, who's the we? that he's talking about. He came by himself, right? Who is the we? Is he like representing the people from the Jewish ruling council? Because he doesn't say that. Who is he talking about, right? So now Jesus, what Jesus is going to do here is going to say something that is inviting Nicodemus into understanding what Nicodemus is saying, right? If you really know that I'm sent by God, and because of the signs and the wonders that I've done, then you need to understand this. So here's what he says. Verse 3. Jesus replied, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. What? What does that mean? Right? I, I get the piece about like, no one can see what God is up to. Like, they can't see it unless something has happened to them. Like, God's revealed it in some way. There's something going on. And that's what he's talking about. Like, you know that I'm sent by God, but, like, do you know now? Like, are you really there? What, what's going on inside of you? Now, Nicodemus clearly doesn't get it, right? He, he's taking this born-again thing, which, let's be honest, is weird, right? 
Right? How does someone be, go back into their mother's body and then be born again? Right? That, we, we get that. That's weird. Because that's exactly Nicodemus's problem. That's exactly what he says in verse 4. How can someone be born when they are old? Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Duh, right? I mean, we get that, right? Don't we get that this a little bit? Like Jesus clearly isn't talking about literally going through the birthing process again after we've already been born once, right? We get that. Nicodemus doesn't get that. So clearly Jesus is talking about something more. In fact, this phrase, born again, that's one meaning of how it can be interpreted. In fact, it's intentional that Jesus uses these words that actually have a double meaning. It can mean one thing, it can mean another thing. And Jesus is going to unpack that to help invite him into what he's saying because it's super important that Nicodemus sees the truth so that he can really believe. And what happens when he believes? What happens to him? What happens to people around him? If he were really going to know and believe Jesus is sent from God. So here's uh, Jesus in response to Nicodemus with his very literal translation. Jesus said, of course it's not that way. How, why would you even think that? You're an idiot. No, he doesn't say that, right? Listen to how he invites it in. Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. That's a good question. I'm like, I'm not following you, Jesus, here, right? I don't get this. So I'm trying to figure out what's going on. You're clearly not talking about a literally going back into my mother's body and coming back out. Like, I get that, but what? What, what do you mean here? I, and I think this is where uh, it helps to try to understand that double meaning of born again, because Jesus is says it again, like he's trying to explain it in ways that Nicodemus should understand. If Nicodemus is part of this Jewish ruling council, his mind would be saturated in their scriptures, right? He would pick up on these images that he's talking about here, and it should make some sense to him. Just, just like this, you have to be born of water and spirit. What? What does that mean? I don't, how does that help? Right? So the question here, does anybody know, this is, this is a fun little trivia thing, anybody know where water and spirit first shows up in the entire Bible? Anybody? It's really simple. This is the beginning. Right? Yeah, I knew there was one. Uh, it's, right at the beginning, there's this, this world that is just formless and empty. Right? And water is covering the surface, right? and there's darkness over that, and then God's Spirit is hovering over that. Water below, Spirit above. That's the key to this double meaning for born again. The other way to, to translate that, the other meaning behind it, because it has double meaning, it can be either one, born again or born from above. You shouldn't be surprised when I say you need to be born from above, from this, from God's very own creativeness, right? To be this, this thing that brought life to everything. You shouldn't be surprised that that's what you need to be able to see God's kingdom because it's God's kingdom. You're being born from above by God's very spirit. That's what he's talking about, right? And I love that Jesus uses this phrase that you can go either way on and clearly... Nicodemus picks up on the one way and has trouble seeing it the other way. Being born again is about being born from God's Spirit. Being born from above. That's what he's talking about. And he's huge. Of course, Nicodemus is having trouble to reconcile in this brain. I get that. 
But Jesus is still going to continue to invite him in to seeing this because it has major consequences, right? It has a huge impact if you can wrap your mind around this need to be born from above. Here's what happens. Jesus is going to continue on in verse 10. You are Israel's teacher, Jesus said. He's talking to Nicodemus. And you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you. Notice that phrase keeps coming up. Truthfully, I tell you. Truly, truly, I'm telling you, right? He's trying to communicate some kind of truth that's going to reveal something to him. He needs to have this. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you about earthly things, and yet you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven come up from above except the one who came from up above, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. So What's happening here, right? I know there's strange stories going on. There's this phrase about the Son of Man and who's that and Moses lifting up some kind of strange snake and people looking at it, right? It's strange things. But the point that Jesus is making here is all about Nicodemus. Do you really believe in me or not? Do you believe in me? Have you really had something where you've been born from above that you can start seeing God's kingdom and start experiencing God's life that's going to recreate you. Do you believe in me? Because that's what it's all about. So does Nicodemus believe in Jesus? It's really not obvious, is it? It's not obvious if he believes in Jesus, if he, as we looked at his life, right? Like, he speaks less but he shows up more publicly, right? So which is it? I don't know. And that's the problem, right? This thing that Nicodemus is keeping secret, it only causes confusion. Like, I don't know where he stands with this. The thing is, is that's not to be us. If you believe in Jesus, it needs to be obvious. It needs to be obvious that you believe in Jesus, that there is this recreation happening in you. There's some truth that you live by. There's something that's impacted you in some way that it's changed you. And you can bring that truth to other people. It becomes part of your life that it's so obvious that people can see it. That's where Jesus is going to bring Nicodemus, as he continues his conversation, he's telling them it needs to be clearly seen. It, it needs to be obvious. If we skip down to verse 21, this is where Jesus is going to talk about how people love to keep their secrets. The things that they've done, they, they, they keep them quiet. They keep them in the dark because it feels like they're protected. And yet, there's something going to happen, this truth that actually sheds light on things. And here's what happens. Verse 21. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that they have, what they have done has been done in the sight of God. The things that are being changed in you are being changed by God's spirit in God's very own sight. He's seeing it. We make it obvious. We bring it into the light. This, this is the very truly, very truly, I tell you, the truth that we have, it becomes a light that we live in and we bring to other people. It helps for them to see what is being done in God's eyes. It needs to be obvious. If it's not, it's just confusing, isn't it? So let's just think about our lives and how obvious is it that, our, that we have faith in Jesus, that we believe in Jesus, right? How obvious is it? Now, it's really easy to make it obvious here. We're 
together, we're worshiping together, we're studying the Bible together, things like that. Right? But let's just think about our everyday life. How obvious is it for your children or your grandchildren that they can see that you believe in Jesus? I'm not just talking about like you've got some things on the wall that have nice little scripture verses here and there and things like that. Or you get them a birthday card that, you know, has a little scripture verse in it. But how are they seeing you like actually trusting Jesus in your life? How are they observing that? That it's obvious to them. Or, or maybe thinking about your, your neighbors, people that you see regularly, right, from your own home whether it's in a house or apartments or the, how obvious is it to them that you believe in Jesus? I'm not talking about like Christmas and Easter when you decorate your house and everyone's like, oh yeah, they must believe in Jesus. I'm, I'm talking about how they can see how much you care about them because you've experienced the care of Jesus in your life. That you treat them differently than maybe some of the other neighbors treat them. How obvious to them is your faith in Jesus? Or maybe your coworkers, or if you have clients, right? People that you go and spend time with in your place of work, how obvious is it to them? More than just being polite and a hard worker, like that's just being a good human being, but what about how you share your compassion towards them? Or mercy when they've done something wrong and sharing the, the love and grace that you've experienced bringing that into the workplace and there you actually are bringing peace into that mess how obvious is your belief in Jesus to those around you it is never intended to be kept secret I say this not only for Nicodemus, because, but in my time in ministry, um, as I've talked about these types of things, about making your belief in Jesus obvious, the pushback that I get is like, well, my faith is private. Well, your faith is personal, right? You have a personal relationship with God, but personal doesn't mean private. It means personal. And, and let's be honest about the secrets types of things. Certainly, there's some things that should be kept secret or at least handled discreetly, right? In, in, in a discreet manner, for sure. We get that. But your faith is not one of those things that should be kept private or a secret. It should be personal. How you've been personally affected by who Jesus is, how you personally engage with a transformed life by the Spirit, is what we make personal to those around us. What does that look like, right? What does that look like? Well, for me, I can only speak for me in a personal way that I experience uh, who God is. And one of those ways is about um, reading Scripture and finding these weird, strange stories in it uh, and, and then sharing what I'm learning with my boys, um, which is fun for me, uh, and we, I read them the story, and I kind of interject the things that I've learned, and then I just simply ask them, well, what do you remember? What do you remember about this story? This is how I'm showing my belief in Jesus. I'm fascinated by these words that are written on these pages, and I want to share that with them, and so they can learn what I'm learning right along with me. How about for your kids or your grandkids? How, would you, how do you personally experience God's transformative spirit that's recreating you and giving you this life that they could grab a hold of, that they can see it and it's obvious to them? How about for your neighbors? Right? So we just moved into uh, a new house not too many months ago, and uh, we needed some yard work done where we had to trim up um, some trees and things like that. And so we, we did that, but some of the trees and things were on the property lines, and so I just invited our neighbors into that process. Like, I'm going to have this done, but what do you want done with these trees that are partly on your side and partly on my side? Well, how would you like to keep them? And then did that. I wanted to care for them and be a good neighbor, inviting them into our space as well. 
how are you making your belief in Jesus, how you've been changed and transformed by entering in his truth and his light? Obvious. How are you being a light in all the places of your life? Right? Because that's really what Jesus is inviting us into. Don't keep this a secret. Make it obvious. Be that shining light to those around you. It changes everything. It, it brings God's truth into their life. It sheds light into their darkness. And let's be honest, they need God's light. They need to see the truth of how God cares about them, even with all their secrets. They need to have God's life and, and light, and you, you are that light. You are to be that light by making your belief in Jesus obvious. Well, what do you think? You want to go be the light? We can be the light, making our belief in Jesus and who he is obvious to those around us? Well, let's make it obvious. Let's make it obvious by doing something, not metaphorically, but literally. So here's what I'm going to invite you to do. If you want to be the light, you want to be that light in the world and in the darkness in all the areas that you travel, I'm going to invite you to literally stand up. Go ahead and stand up if that's the light you want to be. And if you don't want to be that, that's okay. You can stay seated. It's all right. But this is one of those acts where it shows us that this is what it's like. You have to take the step to actually be obvious, to share what your belief in Jesus looks like in a personal way that's personally transforming to you, that will be personally transforming for the people that you are around. That is being the light. And you are the light in this dark, dark world. In fact, as you look around, you're not by yourself, are you? We are the light. And I want you to take these people here with you as you go out and you feel like you're by yourself as that light, all by yourself, knowing that you've got other people standing with you, sharing the light out in that world. Let's be the light because we are the light.